good evening everybody so it's a nice evening time to have all of you here uh, despite your uh, tight schedule so thanks for being here thanks for accepting our invitation and being here so all of us are ready so we'll be ju just starting in a minute the session okay thanks for your uh, patience um in some countries uh, influenza might be more important in some countries uh, it might be the economic um uh, situation that is uh, most uh, important with relation to um the broiler industry but globally talking broiler bacterial enteritis is the most important uh, issue um for our production i'll talk a little bit about that complex interaction between uh, the host immune system and microbiota what we learned a lot about in the last 20 uh, years. I'll explain you a little bit about negative instigators of uh, bacterial enteritis. Um, to, in order to explain to you the vicious circle of bacterial enteritis, how to diagnose, and then last part, how can we solve this uh, bacterial enteritis? What is crucial to understand is that bacterial enteritis problems are derived from uh, as a negative point from a very positive aspect of the broiler uh, production, it is the genetic improvement that we see with our current broiler lines. Okay, And we all know that every year we have an improved feed conversion rate and body weight gain compared to the year before if you look at the genetics. Okay, And if you will look at the presentations that our good friends of uh, genetic companies uh, supply to us, they will always say, yes, we have better feed conversion rate, better body weight gain, because you have a genetic selection that drives through that, that, uh, that improvement. Now, I had a, um, a thought about this, because if you look at these presentations, what is mentioned by the genetic companies is that they select for many different parameters in order to improve that feed conversion rate, body weight gain. But what they really select for, the main thing that they select for, they don't really mention. And uh, I had a chat with uh, Professor Siegel, which is a very um, old school geneticist. He's a, a geneticist, has over 90 years. He was at the root of the selection process that started in the 40s of the last century, started to divide the two directions of selection, one in egg production and the other one in meat production. And he was at the very root of that selection. And I had a discussion with him on this topic that I'm talking uh, about with you today. And I asked him, would it be wrong to state that if you want to improve fetal conversion rate to look at the innate immune system, is a very interesting strategy because immunity is something that consumes protein and energy. And he said, yeah, you're right. In fact, the enterococcus problems, enterococcus problems that we can see, like this picture here is showing a bird suffering from enterococci sitting on um, the hogs and um, with lameness um, is due to a leakage of enterococci through that gut and slipping through that good barrier in the very early days of the life yeah, and is causing when the birds grow older and grow heavier is causing problems of bacterial growth in different parts of the body with possible lameness issues as a consequence so yes immune system is a very interesting part to select uh, for a better field conversion rate because immune system is a high consumer of um, of protein and energy, but we cannot say that we have birds that have a poorer immunity today than 10 years or 20 years ago, because on average, we see that the mortality rates that we have are lower than what we had five to 10 years ago. But that is changing. We have strong indications to, to admit that. But the most important, the really by far the most important reason that we see this feed conversion rate and body weight gain improvements is the fact, and, and Paul Siegel, confirm that eh, the selection for uh, fast growing birds is by selecting the birds that have the highest feed intake capacity or desire eh. when a bird eats every day more than its um, predecessors 
generation before, that bird, of course, if it's converting that nutrients in an efficient way, that bird is able to grow faster. And if you can grow faster, you can reach your target weight earlier. And if you can reach your target weight earlier, what you are going to save is the feed that you are consuming for maintenance. I explain to you in a better way. If you can slaughter a bird at 39 days instead of 40 days, because you have a far higher feed intake, you have a higher faster growth rate, that means that for one day, you will save the feed that is needed for maintenance. And for a bird of 40 days, that will be about 40% of the feed intake for that day. Look to us adult people. We, we are not using feed for growth. We are using feed just for maintenance. So that means that 100% of the feed that we are using is going to maintenance. Yeah? That is, of course, very negative for feed conversion rate because then we have a limited feed conversion rate. But for growing animals, feed conversion rate as economic parameter is so important yeah, that you have to understand if you can grow faster, you can slaughter earlier, you have a much better feed conversion ratio. So that means that we have birds that have a higher desire to have a feed intake. Okay, they want to eat more. That's the first step. That also means that there will be a higher demand in that gut for capacity of digestion and absorption. It also means that for a geneticist, when he's trying to create the fastest growing animal, he should take into account a certain amount of issues that can happen in the field, but not too much. Because if he would, die, he would do that, eh? he would not select any more for the best genetic birds in terms of feed conversion rate and body weight gain. That means that automatically the genetic companies will not select for the birds that have the average pressure that is happening in terms of gut health in the field, but to a lower uh, pressure, okay? So it means that as soon as something goes wrong in our chicken houses, yeah, um, yeah the demand for capacity of digestion absorption will not be sufficient compared to the desire of the animal to have that feed intake. And in the past, we had an activation of a good brain axis yeah, with negative feedback on the feed intake to avoid poor digestion and absorption of nutrients with the birds that we were using 10 years, 15 years, 20 years ago. Yeah. What is meant with that is that if a animal or a human has a certain amount of feed intake, if something is wrong in the, in the intestines, there will be a connection between the intestines and the brain to tell to the brain, tell to the birds, don't eat all this feed because there's something wrong in the gut. We cannot digest it. And we see that this threshold has been increased. It means that these birds have so much desire to eat that even when they have an inflammation at the level of the gut, they keep eating. And you all know that if something is wrong with your intestines, the first thing that will happen with a normal human being, a normal animal, is the brain will be told, oh, you're not hungry. You have, some, you have something going on in the gut. Maybe you don't know exactly if it was salmonella or maybe it's a norovirus, maybe it's mycotoxins. You don't know. But one thing is sure, your brain will tell to you, oh, you're not hungry anymore, right? What we see with the modern broilers, that we have today, the threshold to reach this signal to the brain is much higher than before. So that means that even if something is wrong in the guts, the birds keep eating, and that is causing this oversupply of nutrients in the lumen of the guts. We had this problem before. Now the problem is bigger. But before we had that problem as well, but how do we solve it? Well, we're using antibiotics to suppress that, that oversupply of nutrients in the lumen that creates a microbiota shift, okay? And we're using antimicrobials to stop that. And we didn't really understand what was the interaction between the immune system and that microbiota shift. We just knew that using AGPs or other antibiotics that worked for us to keep control of the, over the situation and have a combination of high feed intake with good uh, digestion absorption um, without um, loss of growth and with optimal 
feed conversion rates as a consequence, right? Okay. This is what we call bacterial enteritis. The fact that we are not controlling 100% the situation is what we call bacterial enteritis. And again, there's a confusing terminology because some people might call this dysbiosis, this bacteriosis. Some people will call it uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Some people might call it subclinical necrotic enteritis. For me, all these names are correct except for the subclinical necrotic enteritis. And I see by presenting this presentation now, I see there's a small shift on this cross. Right? This cross should be over the subclinical necrotic enteritis. But that means that all these terms are more or less the same, clostridiosis, as some people call it. Yeah? Um, and that makes it a little bit difficult for people to understand what we talk about, okay? So, but remember, I don't care what name you choose for this disease, uh, uh, this is where we want to uh, talk about. The problem is that for diagnostics, it's quite hard because we don't have pathognomonic lesions like what we have in necrotic enteritis. Uh, pathognomonic means that if you have this lesion, you're 100% sure this is the disease that we are dealing with. I will come back to that. We developed with VetWorks a macroscopic intestinal scoring system that has been accepted by many companies in the world uh, right now to evaluate this uh, gut health. Bacterial enteritis is a multifactorial disease. Eh? What we always need is some damage in the gut, what we call a gut stressor. It could be coccidiosis, it could be mycotoxin, it could be a viral agent. Um, it could be management even. Yeah, if we don't feed the birds anymore for a long period, we will damage the intestines, right? That can be the start of bacterial enteritis. There is a bacterial factor. And yeah? it's a microbial ecosystem. Something is wrong there. We see there's a disturbance. Most people would say that the disturbance is overgrowth of Clostridium perfringens. Okay, it's a simplification of the problem. I come back to that in a minute. For sure, there's something wrong with the host defense. Okay, we see an inflammation at the level of the host. Okay? And that is, of course, costing us a lot of energy and protein. And we also know that some feed companies have more issues with bacterial enteritis than others. So feed factors for sure play a role. And we know that more complex feeds, more difficult to digest feeds, have a higher um, level of bacterial enteritis as a consequence than more simple easy to digest feeds. And management, yeah, management does play a role eh? because if you have uh, poor ventilation with poor litter quality, high density, we also know that their bacterial enteritis levels will be higher, but also the consequences for bacterial enteritis will be more severe eh? because we might, for instance, have more uh, breast blisters, uh, hog burn, uh, foot pad lesions as a consequence if we have more uh, levels of higher of uh, wet litter. So what you need to understand is that bacterial enteritis and the host defense yeah, are closely linked to each other. And the host defense means it's the immune system. Yeah? It's, and, and this immune system at level of the gut has a tremendous dilemma to solve. Yeah? On one side, we ask the birds to ingest something, feed with materials that come from the environment that can be contaminated with potential pathogens such as viruses and um, fungi and bacteria and parasites. And we ask the gut, take this feed with all these potential dangers in it eh, and allow it deep inside the body of the animal. All right? So what do we ask to the gut? Please protect us as good as possible at the level of the gut mucosa to avoid that these potential pathogens can penetrate in the body and start to attack the host. But we also ask to the gut something else. We ask the gut, please be as open as possible because we give you very expensive nutrients, protein, lipids. We give you energy, sugars, and you have to make sure that they have to be absorbed as easily as possible right? That is a very complicated dilemma that we ask. Be closed and be open at the same time. Together we call this a state of oral tolerance that should be kept at the level of the gut. He will say, yeah, we know, but if you look at the feet, it's quite different from a parasite or a bacterium or a virus. So 
it shouldn't be too difficult for this immune system to make that uh, difference, right? Well, I disagree. Because if you look, sorry, if you look at the composition of a bacterium, a bacterium will be composed from lipids of the bacterial cell wall, proteins, sugars, and all of these bacteria eh, are having exactly the same composition like what is in the feed material. So if these proteins and lipids and sugars are composed in a cell wall of a bacterium, we ask the immune system to keep it out. And if it's composed in a feed material, we ask to digest and absorb the nutrients as good as possible. Right? That's really not easy for the immune system to recognize. And that's why the immune system at the level of the gut is so extensive compared to the immune system at other parts of the body. And we know that because intestines are the most important immune organ. I know that for the veterinarians that are in the group, eh, that we were always teached that the bursa of Fabricius, the thymus, these are the primary immune organs. They are the most important parts of the immune organ uh, system. But in fact, if you look at the number of immune cells, this is the highest at the level of the gut. About 50 to 70% of the avian immune system is in what we call the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So the number of cells, the biggest immune organ of the body is in the gut. Although the intestines of a broiler chicken is about 7, 8% only of the body weight, it's 50 to 70% of the immune cells are in that, uh, in that gut. To protect and to make the different, um, difficult differentiation between um, uh, potential pathogens and these feed ingredients. All right. Why is it so important for people active in the broiler industry to understand that? Eh? Because you have to understand that even a mild activation of the immune system will have a huge impact on feed conversion rate and average daily gain. Eh? Immune system, it needs soldiers, eh? these immune cells. And the soldiers, they only can work when they are paid. And they want to be paid with protein and energy. So you have to imagine that even a mild activation of the immune system has a huge impact on feed conversion rate and average daily gain. In the ideal world, we don't need at all any immunity. You will see that your birds will grow a lot faster and with lower feed conversion rate. And I have some examples of that. Go to New Zealand. In New Zealand, they have perfect feed conversion rate and average daily gain. Why? No vaccines needed. They are living on an island. They don't have any vaccination. They have a very low disease pressure. They have the same birds like you have. They also have good vet, uh, veterinarians and nutritionists, but they have similar birds, and still the feed conversion rate is a lot lower. Why? The immune system there is much less activated than in other regions, because they have the luck to be on an island. Okay? You have to imagine that, and you look here at the slide on nutrient priority from high to low, that every organ will get a certain amount of protein and energy depending on the hierarchy. The one that has the highest hierarchy is the brain, followed by bone, followed by muscle. The muscle is our business. We want the birds to grow muscle and then fat tissue. The unactivated immune system has a ranking which is below muscle, but before fat. But when we activate the immune system, like in the case of bacterial enteritis, the priority to get the nutrients is increased a lot, and the activated immune system will have a much higher priority compared to muscle. And it's even going further. If we have an activation of the immune system, even muscle will be fed to the immune system. And we see an example of that at the level of the gut, because there's a very tiny important muscle at the level of the gut, which is called tunica muscularis. This is a very small um, muscle lining the mucosa and it's used to do peristaltic and antiperistaltic movement and mixture of the feed ingredients with the acids and the enzymes to allow for a good digestion. So if this muscle is being fed to the bacterial enteritis, you will lose this 
capacity of peristalsis and anti-peristalsis, automatically you will see more ballooning of that gut. And that is one of the main signs that we will see when we see bacterial enteritis. Okay, we talked about the immune system and bacterial enteritis. Let's look at the microbiota, okay? 15 years ago, our idea of microbiota management was the following. And we said, okay, you have the small intestine, ileum, you have the shika. In the shika, it's normal to have this clostridia cei, okay? In the ileum, we have this lactobacilla cei. And they are acid-loving, they produce acid themselves. Clostridium doesn't like acids. So as long as the acidity in the small intestine is good, the clostridia will stay in the shecum and everything is all right. Okay. When we see a problem occurring, that is that the shika allow the clostridia ci to escape to the small intestine and start to overwhelm the small intestine. And that's what we call clostridiosis. Eh? Not the fact that clostridium is present in the shika because that is normal, but the fact that clostridia are climbing up in the intestine and are pushing away the lacti lactobacillus cei. Okay? At that moment, we have a problematic microbiota. All right. So if I look a little bit further, and this was the story that we had 15 years ago. What we have learned over the last five to 10 years is fantastic because on this moment, we can say that we have a much bigger knowledge of what is a good microbiota. And what we can see here is the story of the metabolization of carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are being digested by the animal from polysaccharides into monosaccharides. And these monosugars, they can be used by different types of bacteria, the bacteroiditis, the lactobacilli, beef the bacteria, and they will use these monosugars and turn them into lactic acid and acetic acid. Okay? And this is what we always, and I, I, I take this slides from Professor Van Immersiel, which where I worked a lot together with. This was always our story when we talked about um, good microbiota, these are lactobacillus CI, okay? Because they will produce this acid, this acid takes uh, has a competition with the Clostridia CI, the Clostridia CI stay in the Shika, and everything is fine. What I want to show to you is that this story is not wrong, eh? but this story was incomplete. And we have learned over the last couple of years so much more about this metabolization of carbohydrates that allows us to understand the next steps of the story. Because the next step is the following. The next step is that this lactic acid is having a positive effect only when it can be used as nutrition, as a substrate for other groups of bacteria, Firmicutes, Clostridium cluster 9, 4, 14A, to produce propionate and butyric acid. Okay. What we didn't know 15 years ago is that lactic acid is quite toxic for enterocytes. If you have an increased concentration of lactic acids, you will cause a disruption of the intestinal lining and your cells will be stressed. So it's only when you have sufficient firmicutes and clostridium clusters 9, 4, and 14a available to consume the lactic acid that this lactic acid production has a positive impact on your gut health. Okay? Propionate can be used by the host. Butyric acid can be used by the host and by the intestinal cells lining the gut mucosa. Lactic acid on itself, not. It's even dangerous because it can damage, okay? So we need to promote lactic acid production in order to produce propionic and butyric acid. And these two molecules have a lot of positive effects. Eh? I will not go too much in detail, but in general, these two molecules will provide a sound development of the epithelium and a good development of long villi to be... Um, available for digestion and absorption of nutrients. What happens if we have excess of lactate? Eh? We have a pH drop, and this will be toxic for the firmicutes. Um, what happens if we destroy this bacteria here on the left side? Then we have monosugars not turned into lactic acid anymore, but they will become available to what we call the bad bacteria. And bad bacteria are gram-negatives, such as salmonella, 
but also sulfate reduces proteobacteria, methanogenic bacteria, and you will see that these produce as a side product of their consumption of the sugars, not lactic acid and then further propionate and butyric acid, but they will produce gases like H2S and CH4, and they have a very toxic effect on these intestinal cells, okay? So we have to try to avoid that these are produced. Now, if you look at my slide here and you look at the names of the bacteria, you will start to see something very remarkable. We call the problem clostridiosis, but we also see that some of the essential part of the microbiota are in fact bacteria with the name clostridium. The family name is clostridium. And you have to think that in the past we said all clostridia are bad and all bacilli are good, that today eh, we have to admit that some of these groups here that are responsible for butyric acid production and propionic um, acid production, that they are essential for good, good health. That also means that we have probably within this bacilli, that we always say they are the good bacteria, also there we might have groups, eh, these lactobacilli, they are the good ones. No, within those groups, we can imagine there are some bacteria that can produce metabolites that can damage the guts. So you have to be very careful with simplification um, of what bacteria are good, which ones are bad. Yeah? And the best example of yeah, a strategy that thinks all oh, this type of bacteria are good, all this type is bad, are antibiotics. If you are using antibiotics for destruction of Clostridium, I can tell you you're going to make a mistake. Because Clostridium might be bad in case of necrotic arthritis, for instance. Right? But some of the Clostridium CI have an essential role to play in converting this lactic acid into butyric acid. And if you just use a broad spectrum antibiotic, you might destroy this Clostridia CI. So you have to be really careful by attacking Clostridium. Okay? That is also why I don't like the name Clostridiosis when we describe bacterial arthritis. All right? So we're halfway of the presentation. Let me have a look at these um, instigators that I talked about before. Right? So we have a couple of negative things that can start this bacterial enteritis. And we have some infectious causes in that. We have some feed quality and management factors of that. For the infectious causes, yes, there is Clostridium perfringens that can cause necrotic enteritis. Yeah? But usually we look at um, dysbiosis as uh, the main um, negative driver affecting gut health. What is most important for you to understand is that the most frequently starting point for bacterial enteritis is a parasitological disease, which we will not talk about in this webinar, but maybe one of the next webinars, we will talk about coccidiosis. And we mainly talk about subclinical coccidiosis, the one that is not causing mortality or blood in the feces, eh, as a starting point of this bacterial enteritis. I'll show you to you in a minute. Remember, that some companies, they would think, ah, oh, I have some issues with bacterial enteritis, with a higher feed conversion rate. And very often, they would like to refer to a viral challenge to link to their problems. Viral challenges are for sure possible, yeah? but in general, they are a little bit overstated as a problem in the poultry industry in general. Coccidiosis is present on every farm, even if you produce in cages or on slats. You have to be careful with coccidiosis. Of course, there the incidence is lower. But if you are in a classic floor-raised broiler situation, you have coccidiosis levels. Okay, and they will be the main instigator for bacterial enteritis. Okay, feed quality and management can also play a role. There we have the nutritional factors, anti-nutritional factors that are well known: uh, NSPs, uh, mycotoxins. Very important is texture. And we know that if you have good particle size, will help the peristaltic and antiperistaltic capacity of the stomach and the intestines by making um, yeah, a better uh, muscular development of our intestines and of our intestinal tract. Okay? And I've seen in many cases where people say, what if I make my feet more fine? Probably my enzymes, the acids will be able to, to digest in an easier way, the feed, completely wrong. A bird 
needs to receive a good particle size because this peristaltic, anti-peristaltic movement is essential for a good digestion, okay? And indeed, what is the main reason that we have poor gut health? It is this desire of animals that always want to eat more and more and more, even when they face enteritis issues. They will not stop eating, they will continue to eat. So the fact that we want to work with high performing broiler lines is the main reason why we see this um, gut health from a management point of view. But of course we don't want to change that because if we would change that, we would have slower growing birds or feed conversion rate would go up and we would lose a lot of money in the industry. Now, I think you see the big picture. I just want to share with you what is the most common uh, reason of, um, I hope you can still hear me, uh, what is the most common reason of uh, bacterial enteritis in broiler chickens, it is coccidiosis. Yeah? It all starts around, depending on the house, around 14 to 21 days, we have a normal gut with well-developed filii. Yeah? Here you see the lumen of the gut, here you see the gut wall. And it all starts with some coccidia, the, the balls here that you can see, they start to invade these intestinal cells here. And by invading them to multiply in the cells, they will destroy the cells. And when they destroy the cell, there will be a reaction from the damaged gut. This damaged gut will react in three ways. The first one is a villus fusion. Okay, the villus fusion will happen in order to limit, if you have individual villi, you have a lot of place for absorption and digestion of the nutrients, but you also have a lot of place for the parasites to attack the different cells. So by fusion, you're limiting the surface that can be attacked by the parasite, right? But obviously, this is a very good strategy if in the meantime, you're reducing your feed intake. Because by, re by making villus fusion, you also reduce the capacity, capacity of digestion and absorption of nutrients, okay? But our modern broilers, they still have the villus fusion, but they don't have a reduction anymore of the feed intake. The second thing that happens is that we see an increase of mucus production. We see that a lot of the cells here are, instead of absorptive intestinal cells, will become mucus producing cells. And they are producing more mucus to restore the gut barrier and to make sure that the bacteria that are inside that gut cannot penetrate into the system and get to the blood system and distribute themselves over the body of the animal. Again, very good. If you, in the meantime, you reduce your feed intake, but if you are going to produce more mucus by having more cells lining this villi here, producing mucus, you will have less capacity for cells absorbing and digesting the nutrients. That means that if you don't reduce your feed intake, Again, you have a problem because a lot of the feed will remain inside the lumen of the gut as undigested, unabsorbed nutrients. And they become available for the gut microbiota. The third thing that happens will be an inflammation reaction. An inflammation reaction causes also, again, the tight junctions to get loose eh? because plasma proteins will slip through that um, uh, holes between the cells and will be used uh, in the lumen of the gut. Some bacteria can easily grow on that. For instance, Crustinium perfrigans can easily grow on this plasma protein. And that is all together eh, with this oversupply of nutrients in the lumen. Um, and this plasma proteins in the gut will start, uh, are causing that shift in microbiota. So we have the disruption of the normal microbiota that is happening. Okay. So instead of going from a normal carbohydrate digestion that drives through lactic acid to butyric acid production and propionic uh, acid production, we start to have a shift of other bacteria that are producing more gases uh, that are damaging uh, the mucosa. And we can see this bacterial enteritis not by a platogonomonic lesion, but by a combination of lesions, by ballooning, too much mucus and gas formation. Um, this um, tunica muscularis, the small muscle that you can see here is intact at the upper part, the C1 uh, um, uh, picture. In C2, it's been, it's been given to the immune system to react on this, uh, this enteritis, yeah? so it's gone. So they have a flaccid gut 
cannot do the peristaltic anti-peristaltic movement anymore. You can see the same in D1. Okay? D1 also, uh, the tunica muscularis is gone. The villus are shortened and, 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 and fused. Number two is a normal intestine. Undigested feet in the hidden part of the gut because you don't have this peristaltic, anti-peristaltic capacity anymore. And you will see inflammation eh, as bacterial enteritis compared to a normal gut, which is here in um, picture number F, number two. We can see this, back, this uh, my microscopic lesions also histologically. You can see here, for instance, villus fusion. Eh, you can still see the crypts of the villi, but the, the, the villus themselves, they are fused. Um, we can see a lot of infiltration of T lymphocytes and heterophils as a consequence of this bacterial enteritis. So all that indicates this bacterial enteritis. So explain to you the vicious circle of uh, BE. It all starts with this high feed intake with high NSP levels, coccidiosis, mycotoxins, viruses, leading to an oversupply of nutrients in the lumen. That leads to the shift in the microbiota. That leads to inflammation, oxidative stress. Eh? with villus fusion as a consequence. This leads to uh, poor digestion of feed and, and digestion of nutrients um, in the gut, eh, which is a less functional gut. And that again, in combination with this high feed intake broiler lines, that gives you again this oversupply of nutrients in the lumen. What we have done in the past is mainly focusing on the shift in microbiota by using antibiotics. Okay, but we will come to, uh, 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 in a minute, we will come to a much more intelligent solution. Because if you try to cut a vicious circle only on one step, the vicious circle is strong enough to be restored after that you take out your antibiotic. Okay, in this case, antibiotic. Okay, for to, to solve a vicious circle, you have to cut the vicious circle in all phases at the same time. Otherwise, you just have a um, incomplete solution to the problem, okay? How to diagnose BE? I explained this typical science in the bird, but you can see some science generally in the house by wet litter, diarrhea, um, stable uh, feed intake, um, because the birds, some of them have high enough uh, inflammation so they would stop their uh, feed intake, but mainly we will see an increased water uh, feed ratio. How to score in a objective way, you can use a uniform scoring system. The one that is mostly used is the one that I wrote in 2010, 10 years ago. Eh? You can download, download it from my website. It's a scoring system from zero to 10 um, that I usually combine with the scoring for uh, coccidiosis based on Johnson and Reed. Usually we take about five birds per flock and then you can measure the levels of bacterial enteritis in a quite objective uh, way. So again, here, I go quickly over that. Uh, you have some more detailed photos here of how to do the scoring. Everything here is explained in that paper that you can find for yourself at the um, website of VetWorks. Now, we understand where the problem is coming from. If you understand properly what is the problem, we can also think of solutions. And you know them. If you understand this vicious circle, you can invent yourself all the solutions. Eh? Reduction of feed intake. That's the one we don't like to do. Because we reduce the feed intake, we will need more time for the birds to grow to the slaughter age. What will happen? We'll have more feed that will be used for maintenance. So our feed conversion rate will go up. We don't like that. We want to produce in an effective way. We can limit NSP levels. We can optimize our anticoxidal program so we have less coccidiosis. We can use mycotoxin binders. We can use antiviral things. There's a lot of things we can think of to take away this bacterial, uh, bacterial enteritis instigators. The one that we are really um, most comfortable with is to try to control the shift in microbiota. AGPs, we know they work, right? Drinking water antibiotics, ionophores, organic acids, phytotherapeutics, beta-glucans, antimicrobial peptides, bacteriophages, all of them we know can influence the microbiota. Today, we want to focus on pre and probiotics. Together, we call that symbiotics, okay? We can work on the third step. We have to work on the third step. We have, again, a number of solutions there that can do a job. Organic acids, probiotics, part of symbiotics, beta-glucans, MOS, AGP, phytogenics. We know that all of them can have an influence on the inflammation, oxidative stress at the level of the gut mucosa. Um, C4, butyric acid. I refer to that, is feed for the intestinal, uh, the cells uh, lining the intestines. So there we are able to restore 
good long villi if we use butyric acid. And of course, we can also try to influence directly this digestion of uh, feed and nutrients yeah, by using enzymes, improving the feed structure, giving fiber and phytogenics. All the solutions you know. I haven't told you anything new yet, okay? But it's important for you to understand for each of the solutions where they fit in this vicious circle concept so that you can understand that if you have 10 solutions for step number two, you can, you can, you can imagine that probably you're not doing the right thing because you might have a lot of negative interactions amongst this. Try to make a program where you have a cover of all four steps of the vicious circle in a cost-effective way. That is uh, very important to understand. So how to choose these right alternatives? I follow four steps. First is try to imagine, is your company doing bad or good? And to do that, score for coccidiosis and for bacterial enteritis. And we are using global averages, and I can send them to you, which ones we are using. And we know that about 20 euro cents per bird okay, is lost by the average level of cox pressure and bacterial enteritis level. That means that if your scores are lower than this average scores, you can expect that you are losing less than 20 euro cents per bird. If your scores are higher, you know that you're losing more than 20 cents per bird. Why is this important? Because if you only you lose two cents per bird, you already know that you don't have to spend too much money on alternatives and additives to put in your feet, right? Because you can never gain it back. If your losses are 40 cents, you know you can still have a lot of improvement and you know you have a lot of place to invest in additives to help you to control this coccidiosis and bacterial enteritis. That is for me the first step. Most people, they will jump, they will go to the manual of the supplier and say, oh, what do you have? Ah, you have a nice probiotic. I have a nice organic acid. Don't do that. First, try to estimate how much money you are losing before going to the next part of the discussion. Try to understand where is your problem? Is it portonus? Is it a lot of indigestive feed? Is it inflammation? Yeah. Try to see, do you see signs of viral issues, mycotoxins, coccidiosis? Think before you start talking with suppliers of additives. And then you list everything, what you already do to facilitate digestion absorption. All the feed additives that you're using, all the drinking water additives, all the management improvements that you are doing, uh, more litter, more ventilation that you are doing in order to control gut health, okay? And try to think, do I do some intelligent things like developing synergies? Yeah, for instance, you combine an enzyme with an MCFA, you know that they both will work together and they will strengthen your solution. Sometimes you do things that are stupid, like a copycat. You put the same asset in the drinking water and the same one is put by the nutritionist in the feed. You spend two times the money for one time the effect. It's stupid. But sometimes you have to make your analysis to see it. Sometimes you don't know what the farmer is putting in the, in the drinking water. You know what you put in the feed, but you don't know what the farmer is doing. Try to find out. And sometimes, and sometimes that's not possible to avoid, but sometimes you're using probiotics for stimulation of the gut health. And we have a mycoplasma antibiotic that is killing the probiotic. Be careful with that. So by making your list of all the solutions, you can make your analysis to see what you're doing, if it is the right thing or not. Then you bring together everyone, veterinary nutritionist, production manager. You look at this list and you check where do I have a good support? Where do I have a bad support? What kind of tools do I need? And which ones maybe I can take out of my program? Okay. And then you go to the supplier. And then you go to the supplier and you say, this is what I need. I need a probiotic that can do this, that can um, help me to uh, reduce uh, inflammation in my gut. I need an organic acid that is helping to stimulate my villus development, okay? Only then talk with your supplier. First, make your homework, and then you will have a good discussion with your uh, supplier of your um, uh, gut health products, okay? So remember, break your vicious circle with solutions on all steps, all the four steps of vicious circle, okay? 
and try to focus on approaches that can control that micro, uh, microbial ecosystem, the microbiota, but also deal with that inflammation and uh, that host defense, good barrier management, integrity and recovery of the intestine. And if you look at the alternatives that are not antibiotic, uh, then we can see a number of groups of products that are used very frequently today, organic acids, phytotherapeutics, um, probiotics and prebiotics, and pro and prebiotics together we call symbiotics. And what do probiotics do? Probiotics are bacteria. Eh? They are living microorganisms and they will eh, contribute to an intestinal microbial balance. Okay, they can be put in the feed, in the drinking water. They are very important in young animals, but remember, our broilers are all young animals because we slaughter them at only 30 to 40 days of age, okay? And we used to use them mainly to restore intestinal microbial ecosystem after antibiotic use. Yeah? Species that mainly are used in chickens are Lactobacilli, Streptococcus, Bacillus, Bifidobacterium, Anthrococci, okay? Now, what you have to understand is that in the past, we were using probiotics based on the name. Then some people say, I want Lactobacillus. Why? Ah, because I want to have bacteria to produce lactic acid. And another one said, no, 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 no. I have very good experience with Bacillus subtilis. I want Bacillus subtilis to be used. Another one says, okay, I want to have a uh, Streptococcus, eh? uh, whatever. Today, 2020, we just understand that the name of the probiotic is not the most important thing. It is what it is doing. Okay, and we look at understanding the mode of action of different probiotics. And remember, the mode of action of a bacterium, there is a huge variation. Eh? I'll give you some examples. You have probiotics that can modulate gen expression of intestinal epithelial cells so that it can talk with the microbiota in a better way, or they are, they are less quickly triggered to um, start inflammation. We have probiotics that can compete with pathogens for adhesion sites and also for nutrients. We have other bacteria that can produce antimicrobial compounds against other bacteria. They can produce H2A2 or bacteriocin, which are proteins that can kill other bacteria. They are in fact like antibiotics produced in the gut by living bacteria. We have bacteria that can do quorum sensing. And quorum sensing is it's communication. They will talk with other bacteria and they will, for instance, say, hey, sh you should not be replicating yourself, all right? We have other probiotics that can create cross-feeding. They can produce nutrients for beneficial bacteria. For instance, we can have bacteria that are taking monosugars to turn into lactic acids, or we can have probiotics that can use lactic acids and turn it into butyric acids, okay? And we have other probiotics that we know that can do immunomodulation. They can modulate the immune system to react more or to react, to react less, okay? So just understand that the period that we said, probiotic, it is a name, this bacterium is good, this one is bad, forget it. The best example is Clostridium. We used to say that all Clostridium are bad, and now we understand that some of these Clostridium clusters are essential for a good gut health. So we could use them, you could imagine putting them in a probiotic, Whereas 10 years ago, if you would tell someone, put a clostridium in your probiotic, you would say, are you crazy? That's dangerous. No, 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 no. On this moment, we understand that the clue is in the mode of action of the probiotic. And when you have a probiotic, you need to be able to understand how that probiotic will help you in improving your gut health. Okay? Yeah, to select probiotics in the industry, there's a couple of things that we like. We like them to adhere to intestinal cells. Um, under that mucus layer. And we also like them to overcome potential hurdles, like they have to be able to cross the pH of the stomach yeah, so that they can survive after application in the feet or the drinking water. And we want them also to be able to compete with the other microorganisms in the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah. You have different types of probiotics, single strain versus multiple strains, defined, undefined culture, sporulated, non-sporulated. All that is for me not important. The most important thing is, can they be applied in a safe way? And do you know the mode of action of these probiotics to be used? All right. So I go a little bit uh, 
the next uh, uh, phase. Eh? What is the outcome of probiotics? Well, improvement in feed conversion efficiency. Eh? That is the what we usually try to target. Eh? And it can be by this different mode of actions, immunomodulation, improved digestion, etc., etc. I think in the future, gene functions will be better known, eh? and we will not just take a probiotic based on experience, but we will more and more we'll know, okay, this probiotic has this gene, and we can use, we can use it in this situation. And I think the feed choice will be a crucial element of defining the probiotic. Because you can imagine that one probiotic is doing good with a corn soy type of uh, uh, diet, and another one will do a better job when it is linked with a wheat-based diet, right? That makes a lot of sense because depending on the metabolization of the carbohydrates, some will be better in one situation and some will be better with another situation. Now, if you think about that, that's very logic. But that also explains the link with prebiotics because prebiotics is the feed that you will give to the microbiota. Okay? And we know there, there's a whole range of prebiotics like inulin, uh, moss, Eh? Fos and moss um, that are non digestible for the animal oligosaccharides. But these nutrients are going to steer the microbiota in one or another direction. Okay? And um, this is a very logic concept. The problem with the prebiotic is that, um, um, that you are not always sure that the prebiotic is reaching the right microbiota that you want to um, stimulate, okay? So um, the prebiotics have a multiple uh, mode of action and they can have direct effects. For instance, I'll give you an example, um, binding of gram negatives. A good example here is uh, moss, eh? manan oligosaccharides. They will easily bind to um, uh, salmonella and the salmonella if it's bind to the prebiotic it cannot attach to the gut anymore as will be washed out okay it can also have an effect on the microbiota okay? some microbiota can be fed on the prebiotics in a better way so it will start to to flourish and to multiply in an easier way and also there can be an effect on bacterial uh, metabolites all right so just some examples Phosphorus inulin um, can uh, cause an increase of population of lactobacillus, uh, restricted growth of crustacean fingers and E. coli in broilers. Um, uh, inulin, for instance, can also help to uh, improve the ability to kill uh, salmonella uh, entridides. Uh, moss, I already explained that. It can reduce pathogens such as salmonella. Uh, it can help to increase lactobacilli species. Beta-glucans are also immunomodulators. They can also uh, reduce incidence and severity of inflammation caused by amina maxima, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's clear that um, prebiotics are interesting because they're quite stable in the feed. Um, they are resistant to conditions in crop and stomach. They can stimulate available microbial population. Yeah. And you don't have an issue with strain host compatibility as far as for probiotics. Yeah. Um, they will be more effective for prevention than for treatment of disease, obviously. Um, but you have to imagine that to give a prebiotic just like that in an intestine, it's a little bit difficult to predict the outcome. Why? You're not sure that the bacteria that you're trying to feed properly with your prebiotic are actually present in that gut. And that is why people started to develop the concept of combining the prebiotic with the probiotic that we know have a good match with each other. So that's why symbiotics are lately becoming more popular, okay? So, um, and that I think will lead in the future to more use of prebiotics than before, because that was a big frustration with prebiotics. It was very difficult to predict if it would be successful or not. Why? You're not sure that this bacterium that will profit from the prebiotic is present in that gut. If you give in the same moment, that bacterium together with the prebiotic, you are of course a lot more sure that your result will be more effective. Okay? So, symbiotics are a mixture of probiotics and prebiotics and you will find a synergy. 
I don't want to make a promotion here, and, 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 and the people from ProVet uh, also told me, don't worry, Dr. Martin, we know that you don't make publicity for companies. We just want to invite you to give a neutral presentation. Um, but obviously, you work with commercial products. I didn't put names here of different symbiotic um, compositions. But I just want to show you that there are several companies that come with this combination of probiotic and prebiotic in different animal species, because the logic is there. Yeah? So I just give you a couple of examples here yeah, where people combine bacillus or anthrococci as single species type of probiotics with different kinds of prebiotics, most beta glucans, phos, inulin, the ones that I just mentioned before. Yeah? They do that sometimes as with the sole probiotic, sometimes with combination products. Okay. Um, there are some trials supporting that concept. Yeah? Uh, I just give a couple of examples here. There's a many to, to, to find that actually show you the effect of a symbiotic on feed conversion rate, uh, body weight gain, average daily gain, reduction of incidence of diarrhea, mortality, uh, compared with uh, antimicrobials or not, eh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not just a theoretic concept. This is for sure also a proven concept that it can work, all right? So conclusion. Bacterial enteritis control is a crucial disease to control in order to maintain optimal financial performance in today's broiler production. Make sure everyone in your organization, from farmers to nutritionists to veterinarians, understands the holistic view on this gut health of bacterial enteritis. If you just want to go to the products, they will not understand when to use and when not to use. Everyone has to understand this, this, this holistic view, this link between coccidiosis and um, bacterial enteritis. This link between the immune system and the microbiota. And the fact that you need to cut the vicious circle in the same moment, in different steps, before you can expect a solid good result. Use the coccidiosis bacterial enteritis scoring systems to make sure that you know what is the damage. Is it 20 cents? Is it 40? Is it five? Because you need that information to understand if you need to do additional investments or maybe decrease the investment in using additives for uh, good health. Yeah? And take decisions for control programs based on detailed analysis of good health status and the solutions also listed, okay? So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm also glad to, um, to share with you that my main concern was today to keep in time. Yeah? And I can tell you that we are exactly in time after one hour and i would like to thank you for your attention and i'm giving back the words to um, the moderator yeah thank you dr martin it was a really engrossing session so to uh, get to know about uh, various insights and uh, from your experience it's a very valuable session i believe for all the audience thank you again so now i welcome uh, dr sendil director provet to for a few remarks Yes, uh, Dr. Stephen, thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Martin for his presentation. It was excellent, easily understandable. Thank you. Also, I would like to thank the audience for making this uh, webinar a grand success. So, this is just the beginning from ProVet. I assure you, there are more webinars maybe seminar to follow, which will be relevant to the industry development, maybe technical or non-technical. We do conduct a lot of webinar in near future. See, uh, maybe some uh, question may be in your mind. Now we are in COVID-19 crisis. Why we are now talking about symbiotics, how it is related, uh, relevant to this? So the reason is very simple. Because as a producer of, say, egg or chicken, we have to always look for a better performance or better productivity because the selling price control is not in our hand, whereas the production cost control is. So if you look at the last past six months or more, more producers have lost heavily because of various reasons. The placement has come down drastically. 
so it is the time to work on a better output with the available placement in near future with us see maybe the selling cost now presently may be very good it doesn't mean that we can afford to increase the production cost so with such approach in mind we have come out with this topic the symbiotic uh, which is proven to be a very good performance enhancer i'm sure some or most of you attending this webinar must be having symbiotic in your formulations and getting benefit out of it so my request to them is to continue to do so and those who are not right just have a try you will see the difference so with this short note once again thanking everyone who are attending here i forward this to dr ajay for question answer session over to dr ajay thank you right, yeah. yeah thank you sir thank you dr sandil sir for this uh, short note and uh, uh, martin this was an excellent session you have given a complete insight about the uh, importance of the gut health how it is going to help in fit conversion and uh, immunity and overall health so i have some uh, selected few questions uh, like uh, does prebiotics help in binding mycotoxins prebiotics or probiotics sorry uh, pre prebiotics like oh, as a whole symbiotic can they help in binding uh, mycotoxins yeah um good question um it depends on the type and so you have to ask your supplier if they are claiming um this uh function if they can actually prove it okay but it's possible yes uh what i also think is important to realize is that um there is more with mycotoxins than just the binding okay it's possible that um the mycotoxins are deactivated by parts of the microbiota but also by for instance an improved liver function of uh, the prebiotics and probiotics okay so it's possible but again it's not with every prebiotic and every probiotic that this will happen fine thank you uh the next question is uh, for gut integrity which feed is better mash or pelleted one okay good question um the short answer is uh, mash okay the short okay. answer is mash why because on the average your mash feed will have a greater particle size than the particles that are used within your pellet okay that's the short answer okay fine, fine, so fine. in theory it's better for um, mash but you can make a good pellet with a good particle size that will not have that negative impact on gizzard development and peristaltic antiperistaltic capacity of the gut while you still have the advantage of the pellet because remember where i started my presentation was to say that we want to reach the target weight as soon as possible and you will reach that with a higher feed intake and you can not reach the same speed of feed intake with a mash feed than with a pellet feed so a pellet feed can give you higher feed intake so you will reach your target weight better so the answer so there was a short answer was the mash the long answer is you should provide a pellet that gives you enough structure and remember the structure is not the pellet size eh? the structure is means the mesh where you make your pellet from because the moment you are in the crop eh, your pellet will fall apart and then the pellet structure is depending on the original meal that was used to create the pellet okay so the goal is to have optimum pellet quality in terms of particle size within the pellets why you still have that advantage of having a good uh, feed intake that is the ideal okay so if you cannot reach that good pellet quality because you have to grind your meal too fine to make it possible then it's better to use a mash feed 
then it's better to forget about the, the advantage of the pellets and return to the mash feed, okay? But it's better to use a good pellet. I'll give you an example of that. Um, I work sometimes in, uh, in, um, in well, I work often in cold zone countries, eh? like in uh, Russia and so on. And very often there, they have a big problem in the winter time because the temperature is dropping so much that the fats that they are using to make the pellets, they are too cold and they cannot be applied anymore in the feed mill. So what happens? This pellet is just falling apart because not enough fat is used. Okay? So what they do, they start to make finer grinding of the raw materials in order to still make it possible to have a good strong pellet. And then you start to see it's too much fine, the pellet falls apart. In this case, I would advise for you in the winter time, it's not possible to make a good pellet. It's better than to make a good mesh eh? because otherwise you're creating too much problems in terms of good health. Okay? Fine, fine. thank you, Dr. Mesh. Uh, I have uh, another question like, uh, suppose we rear indigenous and uh, commercial broilers, like the strains which we import from or the, this uh, recent uh, strains. So uh, if they are, we rear them on the same environment, feed and water, so will there be a, some difference in their microbiome? Means my question is, does the host genome will have influence on gut microflora? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we know that uh, for a genetic, uh, certain genetic um, um, makeup, um, the microbiota will be different. Yeah? So you have an influence both from the diet, yeah? because the diet will steer in a certain direction for the microbiota, but also the genetic makeup yeah? um, will uh, provide a certain uh, microbiota. And we know that this is the same in humans, yeah? the same in other animal species. So it's also the same in um, in uh, chickens. So yes, it could be that with the same diet, uh, with the same uh, environment, the same management, you have a different uh, microbiota for your indigenous uh, birds compared to your standard broilers. Okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, and what is the role of toll-like receptors agonism in the gut health? TLR agonism. Okay, so for the total like uh, receptors, eh, they are um, they are linked with the activation of the immune system. Eh? So um, so you have to make sure they don't get exposed. And the easiest way uh, to do that eh, is to make sure that you don't have that initial damage in the gut, eh? like uh, avoiding coccidiosis or mycotoxins or uh, viral pathogens. On this moment, I mentioned this in my presentation, but there's no concrete um, solutions to influence that at this stage. Eh? So it's more a theoretical concept at this moment, not really a, um, a practical, usable um, uh, application. Right, thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, like how Prebiotics can control Salmonella and E. coli. How, which way is the mode of action? Wise, you can say. Sorry, can how, I just. Uh, yeah, yeah. How, how prebiotics can control Salmonella and E. coli in the gut? Ah, okay. Yeah. So there's two ways. Yeah? So one is by feeding bacteria that compete with Salmonella and E. coli. And remember my slide on the carbohydrates? All these bacteria that are on the left side of the slides, they would take the, mono sh the sugars and they consume them. If these are consumed in the first part of the gut, before they reach the shika, where the salmonella E. coli can, can start to proliferate, eh? if there's no feed anymore for the salmonella and the E. coli, okay, they will not grow, okay? So if you have prebiotics that can stimulate this presence of this uh, Lactobacillus cei, this bifidobacteria, this Clostridium clusters, and so on that I mentioned, um, they will take away uh, the nutrients for the salmonella, okay? That's one way. The other way is by direct binding. Eh? We know, for instance, that moss, eh, as I explained, they are able to bind salmonella, they fool the salmonella, they make the salmonella believe that this is a gut wall, eh, they attach, and then they are washed out, out of the gut. So there's two modes of actions for uh, this control. Right, thank you. 
uh, what should be the ideal particle size in the legons laying laying uh, birds yeah, that, that's a long story. I cannot just uh, uh, have my slides ready for that. Eh? But but um, it depends on the age, obviously. Eh? But uh, you can find these requirements usually in the manual of your genetic uh, provider. Eh? But um, um, make sure that you have enough particles of uh, half, uh, um, yeah, let's say 500 microns, uh, half a millimeter, uh, that you have enough particles like that in there. And try to avoid particles that are less than 100 micron, okay? So it's a short answer that you should go, it depends on the age and so on, but uh, try to uh, uh, remember this, this, these rules. Eh? Try to avoid less than 50, uh, than 100 microns. Try to have a uh, certain percentage of uh, 500 microns. Fine, right, thank you. Uh, now the um, next question is, uh, feed itself contains beta glucons and menons as a part of non starch polysaccharides or NSPs. So do addition of extra prebiotic needed? Yes, because these are different uh, beta glucans. Eh? So it all has to do with the link uh, of, your, um, of, your, uh, of your glucans. Eh? Uh, that's why we call uh, uh, the 1, 3, 1, 6 beta glucans eh? are the ones that can have a prebiotic and a um, uh, immunomodulating effect. Eh? The ones that are present in your feet don't have that. They have to be derived from um, from f uh, from uh, yeast origin. Eh? You need the ones from the yeast origin. By the way, the ones from the yeast origin cannot be broken down by the enzymes that break down the ones that come from cereals. Okay, so it's a one three one four um, instead of one three one six. That makes a difference. We call it the same. But that's not very detailed enough, eh? but they are different. Okay, right. So uh, there is another question like, can we use antibiotic growth promoter along with probiotics? And uh, what is the subclinical coccidiasis? Uh, so this is a different question. So can this we use okay. AGP along with probiotics? How far they're compatible with each other? Yeah, you have to check it uh, case by case. Okay, fine, fine. Yes. Right. You have to uh, check it, but, but it's a good question because potentially it could have a negative interaction. Ask your supplier of your AGP or your supplier of your probiotic to show that it is compatible with each other. Also okay. with uh, drinking water antibiotics. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, another question is, uh, uh, can we uh, rear uh, uh, broiler flocks uh, by using uh, um, synbiotics uh, by completely replacing antibiotic growth promoter. Is it possible? Um, yes, it is possible. Um, but you need to make sure that in your vicious circle, you have a good coverage of these four steps. I have seen companies where they have exactly the same or even better performance if they use alternatives compared to with antibiotics, yeah? but you have to know what you're doing, follow the steps as I explained in the presentation, and then it's possible. I have not said that you can do it for the same cost always. In some cases, I will tell you, here you need to put on top of this, you have to put this and this and this solution. Yeah? And sometimes I will advise, yes, in your situation, the use of the AGP, is the cheapest way to do it, okay? I would also like to reverse the question that you have to ask yourself, how often is the AGP, eh? can you still improve the performance of the AGP by investing with using a symbiotic, with using uh, organic assets? And in most cases, the answer is yes. Eh? So that means that the AGP is not able to 100% reach the optimum performance okay okay right now uh, another question is uh, like uh, clostridia and enterococci will increase transamination of the amino acids in the gut uh, by that they will increase the forming of the ammonia so should we increase uh, the doses of uh, amino acids when birds are infected with uh, either clostridia or enterococci um, not per se not per se, um, it depends. 
you have to be careful, but you talk about pure amino acids or you talk about protein? Pure, pure amino acids. Ah, yeah, okay. Synthetic amino acids. Okay, now the, the reasoning behind, of course, is, is something different. Eh? Um, the, the idea behind is that if you use your amino acids, you can lower your crude protein uh, levels. Um, you will uh, have less risk of providing a oversupply of nutrients in the lumen. Eh? Because it's very often, it is your um, protein digestion that is not okay when you have some issues like recoxidosis, eh? you have excess protein. I talked about the carbohydrates in this presentation, but sometimes uh, mostly also the proteins are involved. And then of course, by lowering your crude protein levels, replacing by amino acids, eh? you can avoid that a lot of um, crude protein is, is given to potentially bad bacteria. In this sense, this can help. Eh? This can help um, your gut health management overall. Right, fine, thank you. Now, uh, there is one more interesting question, like uh, uh, if you are using Symbiotic and if I go for water sanitation, so will the water sanitizer will destroy the probiotics present in the gut? Yeah, usually not. Eh? Um, so it depends if you use a probiotic in the drink water or not. Eh? There can be an interaction in the um, in the uh, water lines, for instance, if it's very uh, acid or whatever, and your probiotic is not acid prone. But remember that most probiotics that will be used in the in the poultry industry, be it given in the gut or be it given in the in the, in the drinking water, they need to be able to cross that. Uh, acid stomach uh, environment. Okay? okay, so if they are able to do that, they will be mm. able to uh, to survive also these conditions in the water lines. One, two. Of course, in your in your intestines, you have a certain pH that will be linked to a certain bacterial. Um, uh, the bacteria will will establish themselves with a certain pH in mind. Okay. So if, it's, uh, if they don't like acid, they will not go to the front of the small intestine. They will go further down, okay? What you use in your drinking water, the moment that you ingest it in the birds, eh, it crosses the, the stomach. Eh, it will be or absorbed or it will be dissociated mm. because of low pH. Eh? So that means that at that moment, it will not be active anymore in that gut, okay? So what a sanitation per se, will not have an influence on your uh, probiotics. Okay. Two, three questions. Uh, I'm just, uh, like, so is it fi fine with you, uh, Martin? It's my pleasure. Oh, fine, fine, right. Uh, so, uh, can you differentiate between biotherapeutics and uh, phytonutrients? Uh, this is a somewhat different topic from this one, but just for a query. Uh, difference between biotherapeutics and uh, phytonutrients. So, which one is preferred or better in as far as action is concerned? Uh, what do you mean with biotherapeutics? Uh, like this, probiotics, you can say. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, again, it's a different mode of action. Okay, so there's some probiotics that, um, that, would do a better job in this situation. There's some phytogenics which are very, very powerful as well. So I can really not, um, um, I work with probiotics, I work with um, uh, biotherapeutics, I work with, with phytogenics, I work with organic acids, I work with all of them. What I look at is my vicious circle. I see what kind of function do I uh, need? What kind of mode of action do I need? And if it is a phytogenic that provides me that action or a probiotic, I don't care so much, but I have to understand what I'm doing and I have to understand my starting point. So either way can work. I know, uh, Dr. Ajay, I think you're my right? right? Yes, you're so, yes. so Sorry. Uh, can we take the advantage of like uh, uh, enzyme technology, like usage of uh, uh, protease or uh, uh, cellulase or this NSP enzymes or protease enzymes for better gut health? Yeah, absolutely. You have seen on my slides also, I'm mentioning uh, enzymes as part of the solution of a holistic gut health um, um, approach. Eh? 
if proteases are always the one that will pay back, that is another discussion that really depends on your your feed quality, on your uh, protein digestibility, etc. You have to judge that case by case, but for sure enzymes can contribute massively by working on the fourth step of the vicious circle. Eh? And, and that is again to be judged on a case by case basis, but they can play an important role. Okay, right. Uh, now, uh, another question is like uh, lactobacilli produce uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, or uh, you can say reactive oxygen species. Uh, from this uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide is being utilized for the activation of the macrophages, right? Nutrition, uh, neutrophils or lysozymes. But you said more lactic acid production is detrimental for the gut health. Uh, can you uh, uh, clarify or... Uh, I'm glad that uh, the audience was listening carefully. Uh, yeah. That's right. I've, uh, I, so the problem is that your lactic acid production has a detrimental effect on the epithelium if the lactic acid is not used by other bacteria to be converted in other um, uh, metabolites. Okay? So, but you're completely right. It is detrimental. So that means that if you destroy part of the microbiota that cannot consume lactic acid anymore, you will have a poor effect. But in most cases, your lactic acid production goes hand in hand with a good um, microbiota, and then the lactic acid will be used by the good bacteria produced to produce propionic and butyric acid. And then it has a positive effect. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, uh, if we add probiotics in the chicken diet, uh, which one is better if you add in the chicks early stages or later stages? Which will give better uh, uh, response yep. or advantage? It's easier to do it in the starting phase because in the starting phase, um, you don't have a lot of other bacteria yet. You have a more, uh, less diverse uh, microbiota in the early days. But again, it will depend on the mode of action that you want with, with your probiotic. If I'm using a probiotic that produces a bacteriosin that kills Clostridium perfringens, I will not use it at day one. I will use it at day 28 because there I have my Clostridium perfringens issues, right? But if you have a probiotic that is producing a lot of butyric acid, that helps for the gut to develop in a very good way for the first two weeks of the, of the life when the bird uh, is not producing a lot of butyric acid yet, then this probiotic will do a better job in the first two weeks. Okay, in general, it's easier for a probiotic to show effect early in life because it has less competition. Yeah? But it could well be that a probiotic with a certain mode of action is not relevant during the first two weeks. So answer is, it depends on the mode of action of the probiotic. Right, thank you. Uh, generally, uh, in the breeders or in the leghorns, we get uh, dysbacteriosis problem, or you can say loose litter problem uh, at the point of lay, uh, from the point of lay uh, till they reach the, uh, uh, their peak. So what is the remedy or what is the remedy for to control it? Can, can, can you quickly, quickly repeat, sorry. So yeah, 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 yeah. We, we used to get uh, loss of uh, loose litter problem mm -hmm. uh, and uh, dysbacteriosis issue. That may be due to various reason. But at point of lay, uh, it will start from point of lay and it will continue till peak lay. So what is the remedy for, to control that? Yeah, I will have to go to see the cause of this um, uh, loose droppings. Huh? It could be um, uh, various reasons. It could be coccidiosis that is uh, underneath. It could be nutritional. Um, it could be purely linked with... Um, um, uh, ventilation, eh, because uh, maybe you are living in a hot country, as you are aware yourself, I guess. So sometimes we do have uh, heat stress that can call uh, that can cause uh, leaking uh, guts, eh, leaky guts because of heat stress, and then you have uh, more um, uh, wet litter, loose droppings. Uh, so then it could be a management issue. Yeah? Uh, then maybe giving electrolytes could be the best solution. But if the coccidiosis is at the root of the, uh, uh, of the loose dropping uh, uh, problems, then you have to look for a coccidiosis uh, um, uh, solution. Okay, so 
I can't give you one general answer. I can just give you a couple of uh, potential reasons that are at the root of your uh, problem. But I, I cannot just say this is the answer. You have to so define Martin, what is the origin of the loose dropping. Martin, they, I think they are talking about physiological loose droppings. Physiological loose dropping. Yeah, ah. which they, uh, they are talking about. Ah, like like uh, will, the, will the high level of estrogen will make uh, uh, any uh, effect on the loose dropping or the gut motility? Uh, any what any uh, a high level of uh, estrogen level because the words when are they are in peak lay or when they are starting to lay yes yes huh. yes yes will yes, that yes, make yes, any yes. difference on that yeah 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 now I understand your question yeah, yeah if it's physiological for sure yes that can uh, um, that can play a role in it so um, it can help yeah okay right right now uh, like next question is uh, bacteria will produce endotoxin bacterial endotoxin. So, can symbiotic will help in uh, reducing the bacterial endotoxin problem? Um, yes, because the symbiotic can also influence the um, the bacterial population, the microbiota. So, automatically, um, for instance, if you talk about gram negatives, if you have less gram negatives. Um, uh, uh, with a certain symbiotic co uh, composition, then automatically also your endotoxins will be lower. Again, depends on the symbiotic. Uh, like another question is, can we provide uh, uh, symbiotic along with uh, water acidifier? Water acidifier, or you can say even feed acidifier also. Will they are they compatible with each other? It depends on the on your probiotic. Again, ask to your supplier. Some will have no negative impact at all from the assets. Some might be compromised. Okay. But then, typically, they should not be used unprotected in that uh, composition. Then, if you want to have these ones, you should protect them so that they can also cross this asset barrier at the level of the stomach. Okay, okay, okay. So, if, if there is high increase in lactobacillus count in the gut, Will it have negative impact on performance? If you have a high lactic acid? Uh, lactic acid, uh, lactobacillus count, if it is very high in the gut, no, not will it have any negative effect? No. Again, lactobacillus, you have many, many, many different types. We do know that some lactobacillus, they produce lactic acid, they don't produce other metabolites that have a negative effect, and they are okay. Some others, eh, are linked with really negative performance. So the problem here is, if you ask me the question, lactobacillus, I don't know enough. You have to say, okay, this type of lactobacillus that is doing, that is producing this metabolite, then we can discuss about it. But I just want, I hope that people after this session, they will remember the name of the family is not enough. It's not because it's clostridium, that it is a good or a bad clostridium. It's not because it's a lactobacillus, that is a good or a bad lactobacillus. It depends on not on the family name but on the name of the species and the function that is being uh, being expressed by this uh, probiotic right so thank you uh, these are the all whatever the concern uh, connected uh, this one i have taken so thank you very much and uh, i am Pleasure. thankful to uh, uh, all the viewers and the attendees who have spared their uh, uh, very precious time to spare with us. And uh, thank you. It's uh, goodbye. Uh, thank you, Martin. It was thank very you. nice and it was very useful to, I think, all of us because the industry is going under a lot of tremendous changes. So this will be very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Martin. my. It's my pleasure. Thank right. you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah, uh, uh, thank you everybody for uh, uh, being patiently listening to all the questions. So it was uh, uh, the questions, the depth of the questions which the people asked was, uh, uh, can, we can see the enthusiastic levels, the levels of enthusiasm among the participants. Thank you for uh, attending the session at a very short notice. Thank you. And uh, thanks for uh, Dr. Martin for making it a very engrossing evening. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Keep your fingers crossed for the upcoming webinars. We'll keep you posted. In case if you have any queries, if you have any suggestions for uh, any other uh, topics which will be of uh, interest to you, please keep post keep us posted. And uh, bye from all of us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a nice bye. day. Have a nice evening. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night.